Hey guys, it's been a while since the last news update. That's because I was away for a few days in the States checking out the Blockchain Economic Forum. And I wanted to update everyone on my current thoughts on the major events happening on the market. So this includes the BitThumb hack, the EOS mainnet launch, and also updates to Ethereum, and also upcoming uh, mainnet launches. So this will be quite a rather comprehensive and big news update from me and I hope you guys enjoy it. And as always, everything covered here is my personal opinion and not financial advice. So let's start off with the BitThumb hack first of all. This is probably the one that really scared and didn't scare many people. All right, let's start off with why it probably was a concern to a lot of people is because, well, it's yet another exchange hack. It just goes to show that crypto in terms of security for these exchanges, it's not that great. We've had quite a few hacks this year, including a Japanese exchange, CoinCheck and BitGrail, which is probably the most infamous one because that actually affected customers. So in the case of BitThumb, it did show that exchanges are very big priority targets and they can get hacked. But the good news is that they have a lot of money to cover this hack. So why do the why is this situation like this in the first place? Well, that's because what's most likely hacked are the hot wallets. So what exchanges do is they, they keep these live wallets that can be sent by the computer systems. And that was a wallet that was hacked. So it's not a lot of money. What they usually do is they move the hot wallets, um, cryptocurrency from hot wallets to cold storage, which is hacker proof because, well, they're not online. So they're kind of air gapped, you know, they're not, you know, prevented from hackers from ash ever breaching it because hackers can't breach through air. So in that sense, so it's one of the hot active wallets that were hacked and they have enough money to pay for it. But this does go to show and there's still some concern over security for exchanges. Why is this allowed to happen? I do want to say that we, I've been you know, victim of exchange hacks in the past, with the biggest one being Mt. Gox. And this is something that in crypto, we must remember that keeping our own cryptocurrency safe via our own storage methods, um, hardware wallets or cold storage, whatever you prefer, it's safer because exchanges, just because they hold so much money, means that they become a bigger and bigger target for hackers. So hackers yeah, generally pick the big targets and they can spend more effort on trying to breach their systems. So in that sense, it's usually recommended that we all keep our own cryptocurrency. But obviously a lot of people like to keep money on exchanges and that's clearly the case of EOS as well. And I just want to touch upon the whole EOS situation. So last month EOS launched their main net. That's when it becomes a like token living on Ethereum to its own network. And this procedure is probably the most special mainnet launch procedure of them all because of this kind of separation between the guys who wrote the software block one and the community that's launching the mainnet. So what happens is that because there's a token sale, the token sale was just for the software and rather they want the community to upstart and create their own network. So they want to be kind of separated from the running of the network. So Block One wants to be independent of this. And this is why the launch wasn't as smooth as it can be. So there's been this recent kind of FUD and hype wave of EOS. And I just kind of want to just speak my opinion about this whole situation. So it's very clear from the launch structure that Block One didn't want to be involved. They want the community to elect block producers. And there's 21 of them in total. So this is the idea of delegate, delegated proof of stake. So every token holder has a voting right and they vote for the block producers. And this is why the EOS network is faster than say for Ethereum. Because in Ethereum, anyone can connect to the Ethereum network and start mining and producing blocks. So the number of blocks you produce is proportional to your hash power. In the case of EOS, it's not the same. There's no hashing, there's no mining. Rather, it's an election of these 21 block producers and the block producers have an equal right in producing these blocks. So if you think about it, if there's only 21 block producers, that means the network is much faster. So it's always a trade-off. It's a trade-off between decentralization and speed of the network. So there's been various controversies of this launch and various controversies concerning, you know, what the power of these block producers can do. So right now at this current point, I do want to say that life, um, I've been told this a long time ago by one of my favorite engineer friends, that life is always about compromises, especially when it comes to tech. 
The other compromise concerns governance and user fund freezing. Because this is a big issue when it comes to crypto, because on Bitcoin or Ethereum, funds can be frozen. But on the other side, on the flip side, EOS has an option to do so. So over the past week, there was this huge controversy surrounding, well, on what conditions can block producers freeze funds? And are they abiding to this constitution of EOS? Because... Honestly, cryptocurrency came from a very freedom background. We have the freedom to send crypto and the freedom to be protected, to kind of be separated from the traditional banking structure. Because when, and when it comes to the traditional banking structure, when a party has too much power, say for example, HSBC or Goldman Sachs, then they can do a lot of things, for example, just randomly choosing the account and freezing it. And I've had various friends, few friends that had that happen to them, especially if they're in crypto. So that's not really nice to wake up one morning and find that, well, yeah, you're not welcome in a bank anymore and gonna move your money out, or they can lock it in for a certain amount of time due to suspicions. So centralized power isn't something that the community, the crypto community wants here. But in EOS, what can happen is that the block producers can elect to freeze funds. Technically, they're supposed to respond to a community request for so. But recently what happened was that there were scammers that were trying to scam people off private keys and the block producers decided to freeze those funds from the scammers. So in essence, they're trying to protect the users of the network. But the pushback came from the community when the block producers elected to freeze them from themselves. So instead of having an outside party do it, the block producers themselves chose to do it. I personally view that even though that's had very good intentions, I feel like there must be a separation of power in the future. This is very clear if you rename the block producer, say for example, EOS New York, and what if we rename that to be like Goldman Sachs or one of the big banks? If that was the case, that logic would become immediately clear. Too much power into one party is never a good thing. So I do see that as the EOS community grows, and I do feel it's right now, it's kind of taking form and taking shape, that they need to do so in a healthy fashion. In terms of mainnet launches, VChain mainnet launch is going to happen at the end of this month on June the 30th. So what's going to happen is the authority master nodes will be deployed and the mainnet will be deployed on the 30th. So on that day, the snapshot will also be taken off the Ethereum blockchain for the ERC20 tokens, the VChain tokens, and that will be kind of recorded and migrated onto the mainnet. So after that point, it's no longer possible to send ERC20 tokens to yourselves and think of that as eChain. It's not gonna work. So that's when the ex kind of withdraw functions and deposit functions are gonna stop for both exchanges and for people. On the mid of July, that's when the token swap occurs. So that's when you can swap your ERC20 tokens with VeChain Thor tokens. In terms of the network functioning, it's already going to start functioning on the 30th and the wallet's going to be made available on June the 9th. In terms of Ethereum news, there's quite a lot of interesting developments. This concerns the upgrades to the Ethereum network, namely sharding and also the move to proof of stake. Initially, there was this big talk about doing these separately. So sharding as a way to scale Ethereum, basically having multiple computational threads on the network, and then proof of stake, basically migrating away from mine. But it seems to be the case that the new path has been chosen that these two upgrades would become one big upgrade. So instead of doing them separately, there seems to be a new thought process to be able to migrate that together as one. So the advantage might be that this is going to be coming faster and together. So there's a move away from Ethereum Improvement Protocol EIP-1011 where it's done separately and now the teams are moving and migrating this together. So the advantage of that is shared research and fast development. And this is going to be kind of a trend going forward. We're going to see Ethereum trying very hard to change their network to upgrade, whilst newer networks are going to come in and offer different things to this ecosystem. So every network is always moving forward and I see that as a very promising way to go about in the future. Because obviously from this current point, we see that there are necessary upgrades to this blockchain infrastructure. And it's as much as we like to see this competition, it's good to see that everyone is moving forward and there's a drive to do better and to handle the needs of app developers or the app developers. 
And well, that's it for the news roundup for today, guys. I'd love to hear what you guys think about this whole BitThumb hack. Are you guys concerned? And will you be moving money away from exchanges into your own wallet? I'd love to hear your comments in the comment section below. Thank you guys so much for watching this episode. Remember to click the little subscribe button to subscribe to this channel. Thank you guys so much for watching and have a safe weekend.